it took a long time for mechanical tool production and knowledge of electricity and other things to get to the point where you could start building such machines. Um, so that was another few hundred years later that we got to the point where we could build general purpose calculating machines. The first working universal machine was built by Conrad Zeus. This is the Z3. Um, it was working by 1941. You can't really talk about any physical machine you can build as a Turing complete machine. Right? So our formal definition of a general purpose computer assumes infinite tape and infinite time. Right? So any thing we can actually build isn't a Turing complete computer, but if you took his design and extended it to have unlimited memory, it was. It could do everything that we need to do any calculation. That's what Conrad Zeus was building in 1941. I should remind you what the state of the world was around this time. So this is what the world looked like when Conrad Zeus in Germany was building his computing machines. The gray countries are neutral, including the US. The red countries are in a pact with the Nazis, and the black parts of the world are all controlled by the Nazis. So other than this little island up here, pretty much the whole world was in a pretty bad way. On that island, there was a place called Bletchley Park, which is about midway between Cambridge and Oxford, where they were also working on computing machines. This is what Bletchley Park looks like today. So it's now a museum and a tourist destination. So four of the people there wrote a letter to Winston Churchill, who was prime minister of Britain. And they wrote the letter talking about his visit, explaining the work that they were doing, and complaining that they did not have the resources they need to do it as much as they wanted. Um, in particular, they didn't have enough typists to keep the code breaking that they were doing with their computing machines going on 24 hours, or hours a day to keep up with the traffic they were getting. I'll, uh, so, so do you know who the authors of the letter were? At least one of them. Yeah, Alan Turing was one of the authors. There were three others. This was actually you know, a very bold thing they did. So they went outside the military chain of command right, that normally sort of low-level people working on a project don't write to the prime minister, especially in, in a military situation. You go up the chain. But they took the liberty of, of writing directly to Churchill because they didn't actually trust some of the people up the chain to get the message to him in the right way. I'll hold you in suspense on Churchill's response for a little while. But we'll go back to Conrad Zeus working in Germany. This was the view of the, the German military command at the time. Zeus was asking for more support to continue his work. And the response that he got was strategically unimportant. So this sort of fizzled out, and they didn't make any progress during the war. Um, and this meant that they never were able to do any of the kinds of things that the Allies were able to do in, in both decrypting intercepted traffic and Probably the, the biggest reason the Nazi atomic bomb effort failed was because they couldn't calculate the things that the Allies could calculate at Los Alamos. So back to the uh, Churchill letter. So Churchill's response getting this was action to stay. This was the first time he used that. It ended up being a stamp that he would put on other things that he wanted to get done. But he made sure that everything they asked for in the letter happened right away. And they ended up having tens of thousands of people working at Bletchley Park on computing machines and using them to break intercepted traffic. They built, which was arguably the first electronic computer that was used in a large way. So Zeus had a Z3. It was more of an experimental machine not being used to actually solve problems. Colossus was used to break all the intercepted traffic on the Lorenz cipher. So this was messages between the conquered capitals of Europe. And they were able to learn things like that the D-Day deception was working by decrypting these messages. OK, so now we had real computing machines. Right? And the needs of wartime were a lot of what drove the resources, both in Britain and similar projects in the US that were a little behind that, to build actual machines that could do computing. So have we got to operating systems yet? So this is ENIAC, right? So this, this is a few years after Colossus. ENIAC was. Um, doing ballistics calculations. Did it have an operating system? So certainly a lot of the program you can see, right, they're putting plug boards together, right? So for each different calculation you wanted to do, you had to manually reconfigure it. Right? So our definition of an operating system, we said our, our strict definition from the first class, what were the two things that something has to be to be an operating system? 
Good. So provide abstractions for hardware. Um, and that first picture sort of gives you a suggestion that NEAC might not be doing that. OK. And what was the other thing? Yeah. Good. Yeah. So it has to provide abstraction to hardware. It has to control access or, or manage access to resources. To answer whether it's doing this, we'd have to look at how it's programmed. Looking at it from the outside, at least the toys that we looked at the first day, you can't really tell from the outside whether it provides abstractions to the programmer or not. With ENIAC, you sort of can from looking at the fact that you had to put cables together to program it. You can also look at the directions. So this is how you would get a 6 on the ENIAC. If your directions include stand back, you do not have an abstraction. So we don't have operating systems yet. We need to get abstractions. The person most responsible for getting to abstractions was Grace Hopper. So this is um, Grace Hopper probably in, in the 1940s. Before World War II started, she was a math professor at Vassar. And then after Pearl Harbor ha happened, she went to enlist in the Navy and went through basic training, which everyone who joined the Navy did. And then because of her mathematical background, she had a, a PhD in mathematics and had been a professor, was assigned to the project at the Harvard Computation Lab that Alex, uh, sorry, that um, the Mark I computer that Howard Aiken was leading. And she became the lead programmer for that project. Most of what they were doing were calculations for the, uh, it's a Navy project, so they were doing calculations for the Navy and the military, figuring out things like ballistic tables that they needed to compute. And this was programmed similar to NIAC. There was a lot of physical movement, but there were, there were still programs. So you can see that she's holding a paper tape, which was probably, probably a program for the Mark I. She had the, the insight and sort of led the movement to start programming at a higher level and building programs that we now call compilers that would produce other programs. So the programmers would start programming at a more abstract level, thinking about the calculations they want to do, not thinking about the physical resources the machine had, and the compiler would turn that into what the machine had to do. And so there was no, no longer any manual configuring, but you were also programming at a level above the hardware. I should mention that, like most girls her age, my daughter you know, wanted to be Lady Ada for Halloween last year. Um, but I had to draw the line somewhere, so it was Grace Hopper. And <laughs> one of the things Grace Hopper is famous for, there's, there's a clip where she went on the David Letterman show. And she would always hand out nano sticks when she would go give talks. And a nano stick is a bit of wire that's the distance light travels in a nanosecond, which is about a foot long. Right? And as computer scientists, that's a very relevant distance. We, you know, as humans, it's very hard to relate to nanoseconds. Right? But we've got processors now that are doing several instructions in a nanosecond. Right? So they have to finish those instructions before light can travel. Um, you know, a few centimeters. And so uh, my daughter had nano sticks to hand out for Halloween. Uh, I don't have any left. So we're getting close to operating systems. What we don't have yet is the second thing, right? We said we need abstractions. We also need a way to manage resources. We need to be doing something so that individual programs don't have complete control over everything on the machine. Did Grace Hopper need to worry about that when she was programming the Mark I or uh, later machines like that, did they have to worry about managing resources? So certainly, there weren't multiple users that you didn't trust using the machine at the same time. Right? And there weren't multiple programs running. Right? You did have this notion that the program owned the whole machine while it was running. So there was no need for managing resources because your program owned all the resources. Right? The resources were managed by the you know, operator in the computer center that would decide which program got to run. But there was nothing other than who has the higher rank or the more important program who gets to own the whole machine while their program is running. 